All right, I'd like to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies to this lunchtime session, and it's my pleasure. I'm Judith Tucker. I serve as the director of the Master of Arts in Arab Studies and other academic programs here at the Center. I'm also on the faculty in history. But it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce to you uh, Dr. Joseph Jabra, who is coming to us from the Lebanese American University in Beirut. Dr. Jabra is, in fact, the president of the, serving as president of the university. Um, he has, holds a law degree, in fact, from the Université Saint-Joseph, and he received his PhD in political science from the Catholic University of America here in DC. So this is a homecoming of sorts uh, for him. Um, he has been president of the uh, Lebanese American University since uh, 2004. But he has quite um, an academic administrative background prior to that, and it's one that is international in scope because he uh, served as the vice president for academic affairs and research at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Canada for over 10 years. And then after that, he went on to become academic vice president at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles from 1990 to 2004, so uh, 14 years in that post. Um, and then in 2004, he was recruited to uh, serve as president at the Lebanese American University. He has uh, served on, by rough count, uh, a hundred different academic committees and boards as uh, often as chair, ranging from academic senates to boards of trustees, so there's probably a very special place for Dr. Jabra in academic heaven. Uh, but, but he's also managed, I think, as it is very challenging for academic administrators, he's also managed to uh, maintain an active scholarly life. Uh, he, in fact, uh, has continued to teach and do research in the areas of political science, international law, uh, international relation, relations, public administration, uh, and so forth. And he's continued to keep his hand in teaching. And in terms of research interests uh, or research accomplishments, he is the author, co-author, and co-editor of 12 books, as well as numerous too, much too numerous to mention um, articles and book chapters. So it's really a pleasure, I think, for us to have Dr. Jabra here because he is a uniquely positioned, I think, to talk to us about the subject we're addressing today, which is the role of uh, American universities, American style universities, uh, American curriculum universities uh, in the region of the Middle East. Um, and we thought the, a good format would be one that be, begins a little bit on, on the dialogue uh, side. And I will ask uh, Dr. Jabra a few questions uh, about the, the subject matter. And then after that, we'll open the floor to your questions and comments as well. OK. okay. Very pleasant to have you here. And. Um, I'm delighted to be here, by the way. <laughs> I used to come here quite often in the past. Oh, I have a lot of friends at, at, uh, at this institution. Jen. Well, welcome back. Thank welcome you. Welcome back. Um, and you have a long connection with Jesuit, right. Jesuit education. Um, maybe I could start. I mean, I'm, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I myself have spent the last two years in Qatar, so uh, at an American university, specifically our university, Georgetown in Qatar. And um, these American universities are, are mushrooming in the region. But of course, there are different forms of them. Right. Um, there are the so-called, I guess, indigenous universities, which would be more, mm -hmm. LAU fits more into that. Um, and then there are, there are the, if you like, the, the sort of branches or, or whatever transplants, like our Georgetown operation. And then there are these American style universities that um, perhaps have an American curriculum, but are, are a little bit different in terms of the way they're set up um, because they're for profit and so forth. Sure. And we see all kinds in the, in, the, in the region. So could you talk to us a little bit about these different yes, kinds of yes. institutions and, and how we understand the differences? Yeah. I'll be very happy to speak to you about this particular topic. Uh, I went to, back to Lebanon in 2004 
And one of the things before I went back to Lebanon, I wanted to know was really what the role of American higher education was like, not only in Lebanon, but in the entire region. And I focused more specifically uh, on the Arab region. Let me divide the question into several, you know, items. And the first one I'd like to talk to, uh, to you about is really the true American institutions. Those are American institutions which are like any other American institution here in the United States. And there are three of them that are very old and one new one. And let me mention them very, very briefly. There is, first of all, AUB, American University of Beirut. And that was established in 1882 when the Board of Commissioners of Foreign Mission met in New York and decided that the best thing they would do for that region would be to establish really uh, a school for the education of both men and women in Lebanon, but serving the entire region. And that was done. It was referred to in the past as the Presbyterian, if you will, uh, Syrian College, and later on the name was changed to AUB. The purpose of that college when it was established was really to do two things. One, to provide the opportunity for young men and women to get an American education, and secondly, for that institution to serve not only Lebanon, but the entire region. And of course, it developed and, and continued to grow, not only in terms of numbers, but as well in terms of standing and reputation. Just, you know, given the fact that the United Nations is meeting now in, in New York, just to let you know that when the charter of the United Nations was signed in San Francisco, 19 of the original signatories were graduates of AUB. Very, very important fact to keep in mind. The second uh, institution was AUC American University of Cairo, which was established in uh, 1915 or thereabout. And the very purpose of that university that college, when it first began, was really to do the same thing, to provide an American-based, American, if you will, liberal arts education to young men and women in Egypt, and yet, at the same time, to serve society, to contribute, really, to society, in terms of helping society meet the challenges that any given society would meet in the course of its development. The third one is LAU, Lebanese American University. And this is an interesting university. Uh, in 1834, a Presbyterian preacher was coming back from the Middle East. And he was going from one American city to another to really tell them about his own experience. He got to Norwich, Connecticut, and while he was giving his report, there was a woman that was present in the audience by the name of Sarah Huntington. Sarah came from a family of riches, of reputation, and she was the one that really challenged Andrew Jackson when he issued his famous or infamous, if you will, leading, that all the non-civilized nations must be ostracized west of the Mississippi. The Mohegans, were, were in that region. And she was very upset about that, so she raised money to establish a school for the Mohegans and a church. And as such, they became considered, they were considered as a civilized nation and they were not ostracized. And we just, not too long ago, we really celebrated our patron, if you will, Sarah, who was the founder of LAU and the patron of the Mohegans. As you well know, Mohegans now, they have the largest casino in the United States. But when he finished talking about his experience, 
she came to him and she said, I am fascinated, but what are you doing? And I'm going to go back with you to the Middle East. And he said, look, I have a lot of work to do. What are you going to do there, et cetera? To make a long story short, she convinced him. And of course, she fell in love with him and she married him. 1834, they sailed out of Norwich, Connecticut. It took them three months to get to Beirut. 1835, she established a school for the education of women in the Ottoman Empire. And for your own information, that school was established three years before Mount Holyoke was established here in the United States. She had three students the first year. And of course, the school began to grow and grow and grow. And it had an incredible, incredible mission, which I will talk about a little later on, uh, which really stems from the heart of American higher education. At the turn of, of, of the last century, uh, in the 20s, it became known as American Junior College. And then it evolved, and now it's called LAU, Lebanese American University, with two major campuses. Uh, over 8,000 students, 8,067 to be correct, and seven schools, including medicine, nursing, pharmacy. The School of Pharmacy is the only one that is accredited outside the United States by the Council, the Accrediting, Accreditation Council of Pharmacy Education. The only one outside the United States. And the purpose, of course, of that institution is really to provide American-based, not American style, American-based education to the young people of Lebanon and the region, and really to serve the community, the region, uh, Lebanon as well, in terms of meeting the challenges that any given developing society is experiencing at the present time. There's a fourth one, which is more recent, was not established really by American missionaries. It was established by the Emir of Sharjah, if you will, <clears throat> and that is the American University of Sharjah. The same principle, the same values, the same emphasis on American values of higher education. Over and above those, there is, there was, and continue to be another category, and that is referred to as American style institution. There are so many of them, and the reason is very simple. They wanted to make money, of course. But in the area, in the region, and you may have felt it when you were in Qatar, people, whether they agree or disagree with American foreign policy, They'd like their sons and daughters to go to an American institution or American-style institution and get an American education. There are so many of them. Over and above that, you have what I'd like to call American branch institutions. And those are institutions which, which were established by American institutions here. They opened branches in the area, in Qatar, in uh, in Dubai, in Abu, Dhabi, in Abu Dhabi, and there are a number of them. Again, the same principle, the same value. And finally, finally, you have so many American consultants on education as well as higher education that are all over the area giving advice to governments, about how really to reform their system of education, how really to foster and strengthen academic standards. And all of these categories have had, are having a tremendous impact on the region. Uh, grosso modo, that's what we have at the present time. Let me talk a little bit about the values in terms of impact, I'm sure it's this is one of your questions. There are four, if you would, the missions of the true American institution can be summarized really very succinctly in terms of the following. Commitment to excellence in everything these institutions do, 
not only academic, but non-academic areas as well. Secondly, they are inclusive institutions. What does it mean? Those American institutions don't really differentiate or discriminate on the basis of religion, on the basis of politics, or on the basis of socioeconomic status. Very, very clear. What they focus on is the qualification of the person. If you're a qualified student, you're willing to work very, very hard in order to get an education that is second to none, then obviously you're welcome. And those institutions have not only the responsibility, by the way, but the obligation to find financial aid, merit scholarship to you. <clears throat> that's, that's very, very important. The third one, which is very important, and it might resonate with you here at Georgetown, given the fact that it is a Jesuit institution, the education of the whole person. That there is emphasis not only on the academic side of the equation, but as well on the growth of the individual, on the maturity of the individual. Individual student, employee, faculty, staff, etc. And the final element in, in, those, in those missions of these institutions is really the whole notion of service. The noble notion of service. That serving others is not a sin. It's not sinful to serve others. And we tell our students, look, we want you to really excel in your future careers. Individually, we want you to be successful. But your success would not mean a hell of a lot unless it is crowned by your success in serving the community in which you live. And that connects really with the original purpose of those institutions. They were established not only to educate young people, but also to serve the community, society in which they operate. And all of these elements, all of these elements would not mean a hell of a lot unless, unless they're guided by, informed by, undergirded by a very strong ethical compass. Let me tell you that, that ethics is really in trouble, even in the best of democracies. And the role of these institutions is really to restore ethics to where it belongs. And that's a tall order in terms of what's happening in the world nowadays. Let me stop here. You have other questions, okay. I'm sure. All right. Um, perhaps, well, I know from my own experience in Qatar and certainly time I've spent in Egypt and so forth that this is not a project that goes entirely unchallenged, sure. right? And that there is a lot of debate and controversy about the role of American education sure. in the region. Um, and perhaps you could, I mean, everything from really seeing it as the, right. you know, a total uh, in, in collusion with a certain kind of American cultural imperialism in the region, um, you know, being, I suppose, informing some of the most um, uh, uh, virile critiques of it. Right. But could you speak to? Let me, uh, let me just. Uh, how you respond to. Let such me let me notions. just uh, really recast the question into a context, mm -hmm. and the context would be really what's going on in the area, the challenges that the area is facing from an educational point of view. I don't want to get into politics. This is not the time to do that. But if you take a look at, at indigenous educational systems in the area, the way they originate, it was really to graduate students to work in government. Their focus was really to educate young people, young men and women, so that they can have jobs in government. And some of you might remember, remember, or might have read about what commitment Nasser made to Egypt, that every graduate of a university will have a job. And as a consequence, you know, we have a lot of 
you know, uh, if you will, a lot of bureaucrats in the Egyptian bureaucracy. But that was really the intent. Things have changed. Governments have become saturated with gradu university graduates. Unfortunately, the goals of these institutions did not change rapidly to respond to the needs of their society. And that's a major, major challenge. To talk about American institutions, certainly, certainly, there is that perception that America is very strong, America is doing whatever it pleases in the area, and why should we really, you know, go to an American institution? And that's the paradox of it that I mentioned very fleetingly when I spoke about this, that despite all of what America does and is doing in that part of the world, whether you agree with it or disagree with it. People in that area, in the overwhelming majority, would love their kids to go to an American institution and get an American degree. And this is really something that is really fascinating in the area, despite the perception that perhaps America is, is really an imperialistic you know, uh, country now, uh, in, in so far as the Arab world is concerned. But, but there is a difference when it comes to education. Now, education is facing a lot of problems and a lot of challenges in the area. Indigenous education is. We have still, despite the oil, you know, wealth, we still have a lot of poverty in the area. And despite the exposure of the Arab world to what's going on in the world. We still have a lot of women who are not educated and who are not empowered. And, and maybe you can comment on this later on. And that is a challenge for education, and in particular higher education. What to do about it in order to set really the record straight. There are other challenges. How can you get the system of education? I think American institutions are leading the way here. How can you get the system of education in all of these countries to respond to the needs of society? It's very, very important. Very important. How can you provide, really, graduates who are going to respond to the human capacity that is required in those society in order to solve their problems. It's very, very important. Let me mention one more thing, which is so essential over there. And in, in, I, I did a lot of work on, on the quality of education. The quality of education, although there has been a tremendous progress, still leaves a lot to be desired. Accreditation is something that American institution brought over. And now, the impact of American institutions, which are accredited by either the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, the Commission on Institutions of Higher Education, or the Middle West Accrediting Agency, people within those countries are now asking a very important question. How can we make sure that the quality of education that we deliver to our young people is of the highest standard? And there is still a lot of work that needs to be done in this particular area. I, just in Lebanon, we just, they just, the government just finished putting in place, really, uh, the bylaws of a national accrediting agency that is basically, basically based, because we were involved in it, on uh, the American pattern of, of accreditation. The assessment of education is something that is for, well, as you well know, we're still debating the value of assessment here in our own institution in, in the United States. 
assessment, learning outcome. What do they mean? And you have to sit down with, with people from departments of education and tell them it's very important for you not to say we have the best system ed of education, but to have someone else, to have a committee, to have a commission, and say, look, your system is very good. Or no, it's, it's not good at all, and that's what it needs. And more and more, ministries of education are open to that, are open to that. But the challenges are still, in a way, overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And we need to do a lot in terms of helping indigenous systems of education without really appearing to be condescending to them, because they have a lot to offer. And it is a dialogue between American higher education and those who are in charge of it and indigenous educational system represented by the Ministry of Education in those countries that is going to lead us to some positive, some productive results in terms of helping the area. I just want to give you an idea of the challenges that the area is facing. Do you know that 60% of the population in that area is below 25? Just think for it for a moment. The predictions are, you may disagree with them, that in the next 10 to 15 years, governments in that area must, come up, must provide 100 million jobs. And the question is, what is the role of education in higher education? What is the role that American institution can play? Now, let me tell you the impact of American, true American institution, is being felt across the region. In fact, the graduates of American institutions between AUC, LAU, and AUB, and now the University of Sharjah. <clears throat> Those graduates do hold high positions across the region, across the region. They're advisors to government. They are, have high position in the private sector. They are consultant about the system of education, and they're making a difference. But it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time. And that difference is being made along the lines of the points I just raised. You know, the values of higher education is very, very important. The dignity of the human being is very, very important. That's the first thing we, we were taught in American institutions of higher education. The acceptance of diversity is an enriching element in the life of a society is very, very important. And we, I mean, you walk all over our campus, and it's the same at AUC, the same at AUB, and you see these people coming from a variety of religions. When in Lebanon, they have 18 sects. They come together to sit and learn together, to network together, to discuss their agreements together, and to find solutions to their disagreements via peaceful means. Just think for a moment about this, the impact that each one of those graduates is having in government when it comes to governance, is having in the private sector, whether it's a bank, or it's a construction company, their value system, the values that were instilled in them do manifest themselves in their carrying out their responsibilities. There's a lot to talk about, but I'll stop. Oh, okay. You may have some okay. other questions. questions. 
Well, maybe I could just uh, talk, ask you a little maybe bit more about Maybe you can ask you, because well, you have the experience. Well, well, I was thinking about the accreditation right. wave, and I think this is a very interesting thing that's happening at the moment. It's not just actual American institutions there. It's also a real push to um, ha get existing institutions accredited by, as, as Dr. Jabra was mentioning, accredited by different uh, American accrediting agencies. And I, I, I was, I've been involved in a few of these, and, and one in Saudi Arabia in particular struck me because it was a, a national university, so very much an indigenous institution, and we were a, a, you know, a team sent by this accrediting uh, agency. And um, the whole kind of checklist and what you're supposed to watch for and the various things you're supposed to look at, uh, it seemed, for me anyway, it, it all crumbled a little bit in the face of what was the overwhelming, for me, characteristic of this university, which was the absolute total sexual segregation on all levels, <coughs> administrative, faculty, students, facilities, etc. And there was sort of no place in the report to really address this, right? I thought, how interesting is that? So you have a, an, it's, it's an example, but you have an American accrediting institution with a certain vision of American higher education. And then you go to a place where the vision is really quite different in a very fundamental way. And how do you put these thing, two things together? And is it really useful? I mean, yes. was that accrediting trip really useful if at, the, if at the end of the day you couldn't address some of the really basic um, and meaningful differences in the approach? Yeah. yeah. I, I think the yeah. issue really, when it comes down to, and I, I level with a lot of people because I travel in the area. <coughs> The, key, the issue comes down to really the quality of education that is being offered. Mm -hmm. And quality assurance still leaves a lot to be desired in the area. Uh, this is something that is very, very important, very important. And one of the things that, that we need to be very careful about is not to come and say, well, here it is, do it. You have to be involved in, in discussion with these people. Look, these American institutions, uh, the, the, the three or four I mentioned, um, the reason why they're being so effective is because they've been there for a long time. They have their roots deeply rooted in that region, in Lebanon, in Egypt, in, in, in the entire region. And that's why the, the, the students, the parents, really, it, it's just incredible. Uh, we, we had to limit our enrollment at, at LAU because of the sheer number of students coming to our institution. We understand the mentality of people, but, you know, we're bringing together uh, an American system of, of values in higher education, and people are being receptive to it are being receptive to it. They criticize the hell out of it, mind you, but they cannot argue in terms of the general values, the dignity of the human being. They cannot argue about the value of diversity, although we have some extremist movement in the area. But, but really and truly, the educated people, when you level with them, they cannot argue against diversity. It's very, very important to keep that in mind. So. It's very, very important for people who go from here to, to advise and to consult to have an understanding of the indigenous culture before they provide their advice. Because that can help tremendously and add to the value of the consultation, of the advice that is being to institutions of education and higher education at the same time. Maybe I could ask just one last question before opening it up to the floor, because I have a feeling there probably are a lot of interesting questions uh, sure. out there, too. But, um, and this one is really based on my having spent two years on the Georgetown uh, campus in Qatar. And um, the Georgetown is very uh, forthright about what it sees as its mission there. Its mission is to deliver the, it's only an undergraduate program, so it's to deliver the BSFS curriculum exactly uh, the same to students there. Okay, so that sounds 
Yeah, that sounds sort of fair and right. But then when you get there and you sort of ex and you experience that and you meet the student body and you look at think about the context and so forth, you uh, at least someone like myself begins to wonder, you know, is that in fact is that really the best mission for us? Yeah. Is that what we should be doing? Or is there a way in which Georgetown in Qatar should be different in some way from Georgetown here? Now, to be different, but if it's different, would we then be shortchanging people there in some sense? Or if it's not different, are we not paying attention to local context? I mean, I really don't have the right. answer to this yeah. question, but it was a question that very much poses itself when you're there. Yeah, I, you know, you're so absolutely right. Uh, this question crops up everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, my answer, you know, people put it to me, well, there are so many now institutions, are you concerned about competition? And I say, look, competition is American staple. So that, that's what we thrive on. The issue is not competition. The issue is to what extent the intent, the goal, of Georgetown and other institutions, to what extent that is being translated on the ground in reality in terms of achievements. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, really, for me, I think the question is still hasn't been answered. The jury is still out. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is, there are challenges in terms of uh, getting people there. There are challenges in terms of the students. And there are challenges in terms of society. I mean, people there would love to have the best for their people. Mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think the issue is whether or not that's what they're getting, and whether or not that's what Georgetown and NYU and other institutions are realizing on the ground. And for me, it really, uh, the jury is still out on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have. I can't say, well, of course, uh, but I can, I can really uh, admire uh, the goal of, of the institutions that are going there, which are going there. But I still can't give you a forthright answer as to whether the goals of both sides are being realized. It may take some time before that is done. done. Right, right. Work in progress, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's, let's open it up to other people, and, and there are, we have um, a, a, a microphone here, so we can, you can be well heard. Okay, yes, over there, Yusuf, the man in the red shirt, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, to what extent do you believe that uh, these, uh, the American universities are, uh, have become institutions for bourgeois upper middle class students? Institutions and, for what? Uh, bourgeois and upper middle class students. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. Very and good question. To what extent yes. then are they true to their mission? Yes. And the diversity. Yeah. Let me. This is a very very important question, and and uh, you know the institutions that I spoke about uh, <coughs> do realize that they cannot really become institutions for rich people. It's very, very important. They cannot be elitist in terms of admitting only sons and daughters of rich people. And that's why I'll take LAU as an example. In order to make sure that all those who are qualified have the opportunity to come to LAU, uh, LAU gives every year now over $12 million in terms of financial aid and in terms of scholarship. It's very, very important because we want to make sure that those who are qualified out there but don't have the means to come to LAU are provided with the means to come to LAU. So that really the institution does not become, in your own words, a bourgeois-like institution. I mean, it's really incredible to see, to walk on campus and see rich people and people of, you know, uh, not, too, not too rich means, if you will, sitting together and, and learning together. The amount of money we are going to increase to 14.5 million in order to respond to that needs that is out there in society. And, and I, for one, 
uh, go around raising money for scholarships and for financial aid because I believe, I believe that education in the final analysis is the answer in that part of the world. <clears throat> uh, this is very, very important, very important. We just got a grant from uh, USAID and we submitted a grant really to fund 52 students that are recruited from every single part, every single district in Lebanon. We, we got the grant. We got 52 students that come from outlying areas in the country, very poor area, but very, very bright. And they're given the opportunity to come to LAU with really no financial obligation, tuition fully paid, other expenses fully paid, and pocket money. So we are very, very conscientious of this, and we will not allow, at least I'm speaking for LAU, to become a bourgeois-like institution. Could, could I just tack on to that one, one sort of uh, question? I know in, in Qatar, one of the things that we struggle with is the fact that um, when you're going out recruiting students, those students who are qualified for admission tend to be the ones who have gone to the schools that have strong English language programs. And in those schools tend to be schools with high tuitions. And so you have it on the height, the problem on the height begins on the high school level that um, the students that can get into the high schools that are really prepare the students properly for the American education are already class-biased institutions. I think, I think you're right on that particular uh, you know, score. But let's not forget that, that that is not a problem for Lebanon. Right, I, Lebanon is different not, that way. It's yeah. not a problem right. because right. you have high schools all over the place. Right. And people sell their lands even to send their kids to high school. So, it does not apply in Lebanon. Maybe, maybe, I think, and this is some of the things that, that we're debating with, with governments in the region, that uh, some specific programs, mm -hmm. uh, you may call it whatever you, you want to, here in the United States we used to call them bridge programs, right. that, that to prepare really uh, those students for university or even for high school. Right. Uh, just go out and find out where those students are, where those young people are. And I think, you know, I always say that the 21st century belongs to the innovators. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be innovators in the area of education. So while it does not apply to Lebanon, because Lebanon has been known for a long time mm -hmm. about, you know, the, the value of education that parents really uh, place uh, in, 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 uh, educa in raising their families, uh, that is an issue uh, either in Qatar, even in Saudi Arabia is still there. Yeah, right, right. So uh, one has to be really innovative in terms of finding ways to respond to that need. Right, right. And there is, I must say, there is an education city where Georgetown is in Qatar. There is an academic bridge program for education city as a whole that is a one-year program to, mm -hmm. to right. do some of the things that you're uh, speaking of. Yes. Yes, in the back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hi, so thank you for being here today. Can you um, raise your voice, please? Yes, I can. Hi. Um, Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, not the three institutions in particular that you've been talking about, um, but the more branch universities, the Georgetown, the NYU's, all those. So maybe Dr. Tucker can contribute an answer to this. Um, most of these universities that are opening branches in the Gulf are traditionally liberal arts universities in the states who highly value notions of academic freedom. And so what are the challenges when they are going and establishing themselves in places where that academic freedom can very likely be limited um, and where professors are getting paid a ton of money so are probably willing to not really push the system and where things like homosexual professors won't be welcomed. 
there's no doubt in my mind uh, that the challenges are real as you spoke about them. Uh, personally, I have a lot of faith in education. That if it does not change patterns of behavior today, tomorrow that will happen. If it doesn't happen this year, it will happen next year. And, and look, uh, as I said, I don't want to get into politics. But people are talking about the Arab Spring. Now, if you try to study that, you know, very, very carefully, you'll find out that it is linked to education. Although we don't know where that is going at the present time. Uh, and, and whether it will achieve its, its goals or not remains to be seen. But at least there is a link between what's happening in education. For the first time in the history of that region, the element of fear has been taken out from the equation. And if you take a look at those young people, a lot of them are educated. My fear, personally, and I hope it will not happen, that that effort will not be hijacked, let me put it that way, by this component element of society or that component element of society. But the point I'm trying to make is that, is that change does take place. You know, institutions are agents of change. And American institutions have been avant-garde in this. You know, avant-garde in terms of what happens inside the institution. Let me take some example. <clears throat> Those graduates of ours, of American institution, <clears throat> when they come to the institution, they're exposed to a number of things. Well, let me talk about financial aid there. I've just talked about it. Those who come into the institution of financial aid on merit scholarship, on scholarships of any kind, they do realize something that they internalize. And that is the power of giving, the power of caring, the power of opening doors, the power of opening vistas for these young people. And they say, before they graduate, that when we graduate, we're going to open up opportunities for other people to come to the institution. The other thing, the whole issue of governance is understood by American education. You know, if you don't have good governance in the institution, you will not get accredited. But they are exposed about their right to voice their views in the decision-making process about the role of the faculty senate or university senate in the decision-making process, about the freedom of the individual to express themselves, to contribute to making sure that the institution is becoming better and better. Well, certainly the challenges are many fold. There are so many of them. But I have faith in education because it is, in my judgment, a very, very powerful agent of change. Yeah, I, I just comment. I think it's a very important question, and, and certainly one that um, uh, is, is, has not been fully resolved. Um, I would say that for Georgetown, I'm really happy to report that, that you know, there's sort of a, um, it's underway to try to get the faculty there, those who are appointed there in Qatar, on a kind of a tenure-like situation that will give them that protection of their academic freedom, um, and that that's been a really important move, I think, on Georgetown's part to, to sort of get a, a structure like that in place. Um, and so it's not that people are unaware of these issues. Um, they, they, they are. It's, a, again, a work in progress, I think. Do you have a... John? Yeah. Uh, no. 
Thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. I taught at AU Sharjah for two years, so I have some interest in this issue. Uh, my question is about the status of Arabic in higher education. And to what extent do you think what you're describing and what's happening in the Gulf is a eroding the use of Arabic in higher education and the state sector, which, after all, is going to be the sector that educates the majority of students in most countries? Uh, you know, that's a very, very important question, and, and we're, we're struggling with it at LAU. Uh, I'll tell you about our own experience. Uh, we don't offer any, any, you know, courses in Arabic. Uh, we haven't done it for a long time. The university hasn't for a long time. But we came to the realization that, that the institution, although an American institution, could not really ignore Arabic. And we're introducing Arabic on different levels. Uh, first, we, we, our goal is to become a place where Arabic is studied fully by, by uh, international students, international scholars, as well as local scholars. It's very, very important. The other thing we put in place, and it's been very, very successful so far, and people are urging us to continue. We have in place a six-week summer program. We call it SINARC program. And that program is designed, really, to provide Arabic teaching for anybody from the United States, from Europe, from everywhere. And we're having indigenous people who are really terrific in Arabic teach those courses. It is something that we are facing. It's a real problem for American institution. But we need really to be innovative about making sure that Arabic is not ignored. It's a very, very, very important question that you raised. Mm -hmm. And I would just add, it's obviously, you know, it's hit the Gulf big time, as you know, this whole debate about what to do about Arabic, uh, you know, which is an enormously important part of heritage, history, culture, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I know that, you know, Georgetown's answer in formation has been really to, to take very seriously Arabic education. Of course, the major part of the curriculum is not taught in Arabic, it's taught in English, but the Arabic program has been developing with two tracks in it. One, a heritage learner's track, because we have a lot of students, Gulf students, who are Arabic speakers, but who, because Arabic has become so weak in the high school levels, they are functionally illiterate Arabic speakers. So you have to address the needs of that group, as well as addressing the needs who are of, of students who are true um, you know, second language Arabic learners. So yes, this young woman in the back has been trying to ask a question. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I actually have a couple questions, but I'll try to be brief. Um, oh, my name is Shadia Kawa, by the way. I, I'm an alumna of both the American University of Beirut as an undergraduate and an alumna of Georgetown as a master's student, formerly. So I've been exposed to both and enjoyed both. Uh, but my question had to do with, the first one was, uh, could you please reflect a little bit on opportunities for student engagement in the implementation and realization of the values and uh, educational uh, objectives of both the uh, American educational system and the Middle Eastern um, side. Because you spoke about, you know, the academic institutions being, uh, you know, environments for uh, change and uh, the role of innovation and so on, but what are the roles of, what are opportunities for student engagement in the implementation of these objectives? Could you? I'm not sure I quite understand. So student engagement. Yes. So it, basically, you, you're talking about, for example, faculty members yeah. who you know, are sent over there or appointed and so on. But I'm talking about the students who come as undergraduates or as graduate students who are still very relatively young, who are being exposed to these ideas, who may not necessarily be very set-minded in the, the, the way the system works. Um, so what are opportunities for student engagement in the decision-making processes and the role for innovation and so on. So student governance, is student role in governance of the university? 
In part, but uh, whether it's at the level of student councils or whether it's at the level of just being in a classroom and, and, and knowing about opportunities to engage in innovative processes, so not, so, which is something that the United States academic systems have um, opportunities for. So for example, when I was here, there were opportunities to do research. There were opportunities to publish papers with my professors. There were opportunities also to attend certain meetings about uh, you know, future changes in the university and in the coursework and so on. There were opportunities to give, provide feedback about my courses and what I think should, you know, be changed and so on. Mm -hmm. so. If we're talking so, about student engagement, I can yeah. elaborate on that. Student I engagement, think. yes. I think student engagement is, is something that is very, very important. Let me, let me talk to this, uh, speak to this issue for a bit. Uh, at the university, <clears throat> Student engagement is taking place at two levels, besides, you know, the academic side of it. First is student elections. I mean, students contribute really to the election laws that we put in place with the university. And every year we have an election, uh, the students elect their representatives, and we have a student council, and they are listened to and contribute, really, to the decision-making process at the university. There is another dimension that we put in place, and it, now it's very, very popular, and that is civic engagement of our students, not only at the university, but within the environment itself. Uh, this is really something that is very, very important. It took off like wildfire at, in, at, at the university. And, and we have students by the hundreds who are engaged with, with uh, NGOs, who are engaged, you know, with government, uh, who are engaged in the private sector. Uh, and it is really something that is very, very important for us. And we're providing our students with the opportunity to do that. In fact, we're asking our faculty to try to seize the opportunity to take the opportunity and convert that into a learning experience as well, for which students will get credit. So that is on our uppermost on our mind, and we're working very, very hard at it. And I think AUB is doing the same thing, uh, AUC is doing the same thing, and other institutions are as well. Okay. I think we have time for one. One last question, and uh, right here, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, oh. I, I'm not Joe Silvanek. Um, I, 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 I understand you're an expert on international relations, and I would like you to, you, you to talk about how we're doing on teaching students about international relations. Uh, when I was uh, at Columbia University, I was elected to the University Senate, and I did an internship on Arab League at International Peace Academy. Um, I first saw Clovis Maxud give a lecture in 2005, but in 1981, we did not have a meeting with him due to the tensions with the Palestinians and Sadat. And I, I would like to see improvement of cultural understanding. Uh, the president of Lebanon is, is very much like a European president, but th there were several Arab countries where the rulers or presidents were seen like the, the Ottoman provincial elite with families, and the Ottoman provincial elite may have just resumed power after 1945. And I think we, you know, with the recent Arab Spring, uh, so I just wanted to ask you if you, you would encourage people to study the uh, career of Clovis Maxud and diplomats, um, how you feel about the cultural teaching of the history of the late Ottoman era and uh, the Palestinians where I, I could favor going from observer status to voting if, if there was, uh, in the United Nations, if there was no, no Israeli withdrawals. Uh, so please go well, welcome. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. One of the things really that that I did in Lebanon <clears throat> when I went there is to take the university out of politics. And and uh, although I am a, a lawyer and political scientist, I don't talk about politics because it's very very important to keep the university at arm's length and not get the university embroiled in 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 local politics. It's very, very important for me. I, I mean, we talk about it, but we don't take stand, uh, either with this or with that, uh, because of the nature of our student body that come from everywhere. And, and you don't want the university to become the spokes institution, if you will, for, for this particular group or that particular group. 
Now, you know, if you want to go to the history of the Ottoman Empire and the role, you know, the, the Arab intelligentsia played in that, that's a, that can take a long time. But certainly, certainly they did a, a terrific job in terms of articulating. In fact, if you take a look at most of the parties that that in political parties that emerged in that part of the world, the founders, the founders really, most of them were Christian Lebanese. That, that, and, and this is something that, that we can talk about at, at length. Uh, but uh, you said something about the president of Lebanon as being a European. What did you mean by that? Uh, I, I, I wanted to clarify what I meant. Uh, I, I feel there is a cultural dilemma with the Arab Spring and the Georgetown students Several uh, of, the, of the Arab countries became republics, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, uh, Syria, uh, and Yemen, uh, with a president uh, and, and with what we would call token political opposition on the ballot in Egypt and Tunisia. But the younger people in those countries felt that their presence weren't truly democratic, that Mr. Mubarak only had like uh, opposition with Mr. Noor with about 11 percent of the vote, uh, and that um, they were complaining their countries weren't truly democratic, that there was still an elite in power with these powerful families. And it remind, it remind, I, think, I think that there might have been a, a system after 1945 where these families were in, around for centuries and centuries, or where they might have been the political elite Ottoman days, they dominated the government. While in contrast to those countries, I think Lebanon has more of a modern political system where the president is genuinely uh, for civil liberties, like like the presidents in Europe, uh, and I, I but and but, but but as I discovered uh, in 2009 when I entered comments on the Obama administration's websites, I think we've we've made some progress in U.S. understanding of Arab culture, but we we need to make greater progress in that area, and, and that's what sure. I, I meant is that we, we, we uh, Lebanon seems to be on the wavelength of European values, but we recently had conflicts in several countries where. Uh, the, the, the president took the title of the president, and then the, the people were saying, well, why isn't our president for freedom like the people in Europe? The president seems like a, running a military Franco-type regime, or uh, the president is, is, is enough for our freedom. So that, that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just make one comment. Before, that, that Look, when we look at the Arab world and we say we want democracy right now, just take a look at how long it took Europe and the United States to become really a true democracy at that. And we're still questioning some of the practices that, that go on. So I'm, I'm really, and, and, and the answer for me is very, very simple. Education will change slowly but surely the way people govern themselves. And it may, they may have to pay a very heavy price for that, as you know, happened in this country, as happened in Europe. Thank you so much. We have to thank Dr. Jabra, and I'm sure you have a couple of minutes maybe to take questions from people individually sure, after sure. the talk. Sure, sure. I'll be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Really.